review the ACLS algorithm for bradycardia with pulse, as patients with both sick sinus syndrome and sinus bradycardia can go on to develop hemodynamic instability in the setting of bradycardia, which can be life-threatening. However, our focus initially moving forward here is going to be on sinus bradycardia as well as sick sinus syndrome, both of which are going to have characteristic findings on EKG. We will begin first with a discussion of sinus bradycardia. In sinus bradycardia, our most common presentation is going to be an asymptomatic athlete. However, those with sinus bradycardia who do develop symptoms may go on to develop lightheadedness, presyncope or syncope, worsening of angina or chest pain, especially if they have comorbid heart disease. And ultimately, patients with sinus bradycardia can also go on to develop hemodynamic instability. There are multiple factors that can ultimately underlie sinus bradycardia. One of the most common is high vagal tone, which we classically see in well-trained athletes, and also during sleep, where there is an increase in vagal activity. We can also see sinus bradycardia early in the course of sick sinus syndrome, which we'll discuss in more detail later in this set of modules. We can also see sinus bradycardia in the setting of myocardial infarction, obstructive sleep apnea, increased intracranial pressure, as well as hypothyroidism and anorexia nervosa. Ultimately, we can diagnose sinus bradycardia using an EKG, which is going to classically show a heart rate that is less than 60 beats per minute, and this is going to be of sinus origin. We can tell that the bradycardia is of sinus origin first by looking at lead 2 and seeing that there are upright P waves. Therefore, if we were to look at this particular EKG, assuming that this strep lasts for 10 seconds, we can first simply count up the number of QRS complexes. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 QRS complexes. Because this is a 10 second strip, we can then multiply this by 6 in order to get the number of beats that we would have in the course of 60 seconds. And therefore, just quickly doing out the math here, 8 times 6 is going to give us 48 beats per minute. And therefore, we know from this information that this patient is indeed bradycardic. We then simply look at lead 2, and we can see that the P waves are upright. And therefore, this is a classic EKG for sinus bradycardia. In terms of management, if our patient with sinus bradycardia is asymptomatic, then no intervention is going to be required. There are plenty of patients walking around with slow heart rates who are completely stable and have no symptoms as a result of this condition. We should, however, try, regardless of the patient's condition, to assess and address underlying causes, such as medications, which could be contributing to this. However, once the patient is hemodynamically unstable as a result of sinus bradycardia, then we proceed with our ACLS algorithm, which we will review in detail at the conclusion of this series. This begins first by giving atropine IV 0.5 milligrams. Atropine inhibits vagal activity, inputting to the heart, including the AV node, thus resulting in an increase in heart rate. We are then able to repeat this 0.5 milligram dose every 3 to 5 minutes, up to a total of 3 milligrams. However, as we will see later in our algorithm, in patients who are hemodynamically unstable and are not responding to that first 0.5 milligram dose of atropine, then we should proceed with transcutaneous cardiac pacing. From there, we can consider the use of additional presser medications, including IV dopamine as well as IV epinephrine.